In the year 2004, January of 2004, four students in Harvard University had a bit of a dream. They decided that they wanted to better connect with other students on campus. And so they developed the software, being Harvard students, that enabled them to look at other students, connect with other students, and it was an overnight sensation. Within 24 hours, there were 1,500 users of this service. Within the month, half of the undergraduate population at Harvard had enrolled in this connecting service. By March, so two months later, it expanded to other Ivy League institutions in the Northeast. And by October, there were 1.5 million users of this social connection service. Now, at the time, you still had to have a .edu, a college email address, to be a participant on this network. I can remember going to OVU and getting my edu email address and being excited that I could sign up for it. But it wasn't until 2006 that it opened up to the wider population. Anybody with any email address could be a user of Facebook. It had meteoric rise, and no time flat, there were 100 million users of Facebook. Now, this rise to power, fame, and affluence that Zuckerberg and the other creators of Facebook experienced is kind of the American dream, isn't it? It's the Peter Pan idea that with a little faith trust and a little pixie dust, all of your dreams are going to come true. This is what we have really brought to play in our lives in a multitude of ways not small of which is the little computers that we carry around in our pockets all the time. We carry around our iPhones with immediate access of, of communication. You send a text or an email to somebody and you expect an immediate reply and response. It's changed the ways that we communicate. It's changed the ways that we work. It's changed the ways that we shop. Think about Amazon. When you make a prime order, you expect it to be at your doorstep in 48 hours, if not sooner. This microwave mentality that whatever we want, whatever dreams, big or small that we have, can be ours in a matter of moments, has cultivated a place in our hearts, in our lives, that's changed the way we work, shop, eat, communicate. And I wonder this morning, has it changed the ways that we interact with God? Has this microwave mentality that whatever we want can be ours in a moment's notice impacted our theology? We're going to look through these questions this morning through the story of a Jewish man who lived 2,500 years ago named Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel also had a dream of connecting people not with each other, but connecting people with God. However, Zerubbabel's dream did not follow the metrics of success that Zuckerberg's did. Zerubbabel faced a mountain of opposition, a small start a load of delays, and a feeling of forgottenness. But before we get into the thick of Zerubbabel's story, I think that we need to understand a little bit of a historical context. So what we're going to do is a super fast thousand-year overview of what happened from Scott closing us out in Exodus last week to the post-exilic state where Zerubbabel found himself. So in Exodus chapter 40, the, temp uh, the tabernacle, pardon me, had been constructed, and the presence of God came to dwell in the tabernacle. It was the center of worship for the people of God for 500 years. They carried the tabernacle with them as they went and conquered the promised land, and they took the tabernacle into the holy city as the place of worship. Now, David wanted to build a permanent house for God, a temple, but God said, no, that job is not for you, it's for your son. And so Solomon built a permanent structure, the temple for the presence of God at the consecration came to dwell physically just as it had over the tabernacle in Exodus chapter 40. Now this temple, Solomon's temple, stood for 400 years until Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Babylon, king of Babylon came and invaded and conquered Jerusalem. Now, the way that the Babylonians conquered a people was not just come in, stake the flag, hey, you report to us now, your taxes come here. The way that the Babylonians conquered was by utterly decimating the national identity of those people. And so when Nebuchadnezzar came in to Jerusalem, 
He took all of the holy articles out of the temple and burned it to the ground. Furthermore, he took the best and brightest out of Judah and deported them to Babylon. Took them away, didn't want them to speak their native language, didn't want them to worship their native God, didn't want them to have anything to do with their identity as the people of God. But even in that foreign land, in that foreign place, in Babylon, God was still at work. It was in this context that our man of the morning, Zerubbabel, was born. His name literally means begotten in Babylon, Zerubbabel, Babylon. He was born in Babylon, though his grandfather had been the last king of Judah. And while he was living in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar's crew got conquered by Cyrus the Persian. And Cyrus had a different purview, a different way of ruling, and he said, hey, let's send all of these deported people back to their homelands. He thought that if he could be a benevolent ruler, people would serve him more gladly. So he said, everybody can go back where you came from. So after 70 years, there were 50,000 exiled Jews that said they want to go home. And so Zerubbabel became the one, the leader, as the grandson of the last king, to lead this group of 50,000 Jews back home. It's with this context that we pick up with Zerubbabel's story this morning and Zerubbabel's dream. When he got back into Jerusalem, he had this dream of connecting people with God. How does that happen for the ancient Israelites? It happens with sacrifice and worship. The first thing that they did was to rebuild the altar. If you have your Bibles, look in Ezra chapter 3 with me. And you'll see that not only did they rebuild the altar, but they decided that to renew this fellowship with God, they needed to rebuild that temple. And so they started laying the foundation stones of the temple. Look at Ezra chapter 3, verse 10. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his steadfast love endures forever towards Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. It sounds like Zerubbabel's dream is just right on track, that it's all coming together, it's all going to work out, the people are just exhilarated that God has brought them home and is now enabling them to rebuild the temple. But the joy was not long to last. In fact, immediately, look at verse 12, what happens. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid. Though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. So there's this cacophony of shouting, some for joy, some in utter pain of the way things are working out. So Zerubbabel's first opposition in rebuilding the temple is an internal one. His first opposition to do this dream of God, to connect people back into worship, is an internal opposition from God's people who don't want to see this new thing, this new change, this new work of God happening. Unfortunately, Zerubbabel's opposition was not only internal. There were external forces that opposed the fulfillment of this dream as well. Skip over a bit to Ezra chapter 4, verse 4. The people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build. Verse 5, they bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. So there's this internal anguish, opposition from people of God that don't want to see this dream happen. And then there's external opposition 
from the people in the land, the, the Samaritans and other peoples who had filled kind of this vacuum when all of the uh, people of Judah were exported to Babylon. There's internal pressure, there's external pressure, and it's not only that, but these people of the land, Ezra 4, 4, they write a letter to the king of the day, and they say, hey, they're trying to build the temple back. Think you may want to know about this. It's not going to be good. Look at Ezra 4, verse 15. In order that search may be made in the book of records of your fathers, you'll find in the book of records and learn that this city is a rebellious city, hurtful to kings and provinces, and that sedition was stirred up in it from old. That is why the city was laid waste. They're lying about who the people of God are. And the king bites and says, have them cease work immediately. Zerubbabel's dream of rebuilding this temple comes to a screeching halt. I wonder if you have ever been in a situation like that. When you felt like you had clarity from God about something, a good and a beautiful, righteous, a holy dream, something that you were pursuing for the good of the kingdom. And then you face obstacles, internal, external, political, a mountain of obstacles laid before Zerubbabel, and it is not a strange feeling to us either, is it? Now, the way your Old Testament is compiled is not strictly chronological. So Ezra, though it's kind of in the middle of your Old Testament, is actually things happening a lot later, right? Things happening towards the end of um, the Second Temple period. But we have the letters of the prophets. They're kind of placed backwards in time. So even though if you're flipping through your Bible to the minor prophets, which is where we're going to go next, Remember that we're not skipping time. We're actually like reading the history book and then flipping over and reading the exact letters and oracles and things that happen. It's like reading your American history book and then alongside it having an actual letter from George Washington. That's what we're doing here. So flip with me to Zechariah chapter 4. After these years of opposition, years of waiting, God finally speaks into the silence. It was 15 years between what we just read in Ezra 3 and 4 and what happens in Zechariah chapter 4 when this oracle comes from the Lord. 15 years. And when we're talking in terms of the Bible and we're like, okay, we're going to do a thousand years of Israelite history. This happened for 400 years. We kind of get numb to the numbers a little bit, right? But 15 years is no small amount of time. 15 years ago was 2008. And think a little bit about what you were doing 15 years ago. In 2008, um, we were the brink of a financial crisis and a great recession. In 2008, the iPhone was just a year old. In 2008, Redbox had just made it to Arkansas. In 2008, Amazon was still selling books. This was a while ago, even for us. 15 years is no small amount of time. And yet when we approach our goals, when we approach our dreams, our God-sized dreams, we often come with this microwave mentality that we want it to happen on our own terms and timetable instead of God's. And so I wonder if Zerubbabel and his crew felt the same way. I think there's evidence in the text that they did. Listen to Zechariah chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. And he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, the hands of the Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range throughout the whole earth. Now this is an oracle, a prophecy, a dream that Zechariah had. Zechariah was a young prophet who served alongside Haggai, an older prophet, 
Their letters are right there together, and both of them are trying to communicate the point that God has not given up on his people, his plan, his program, or his promises. And we see that here when he says, God says, Zerubbabel will put the capstone. He's laid the foundation stone, but he's also going to lay the capstone of this temple. This temple is going to be built, not just that it's going to be built, but it's going to be built by Zerubbabel. And it's not so that we can look and say, how great is Zerubbabel? What a hero of the faith. How determined he just had the tenacity to go against the political powers and all the opposition that was before him. No way. Zerubbabel did not have that strength within him to face the mountain of opposition that was before him. What does God say in this image? He says that there's a great mountain of opposition. Remember, it's internal, it's external, it's political. But it's before Zerubbabel. And it says, before Zerubbabel, this mountain shall become a plain. God slides in like a glacier and cuts down every obstacle that lies before Zerubbabel to complete this plan. In fact, the way that it unfolds, Ezra chapter 6 verse 7, says that not only are the people, they write this letter and they say, are we, hey, they're rebuilding the temple, are things going to go Okay. And the new king responds, and do you know what he says? Yeah, let them build. And not only that, he says, moreover, we will pay for it from the temple treasury. We will pay for the rebuilding of this temple from the taxes that we take in in the land. God is making the mountain become a plain before Zerubbabel. And it's not so that Zerubbabel looks really great, is it? It says, not by strength or by might, but by my spirit. I think that as we look through scripture, this is a pattern that we often see displayed. That God allows the obstacles to pile up before him, before us, so that his glory may be on display. It's really the same thing that we see in John chapter 11. It's the same thing when Lazarus becomes sick. When Lazarus becomes sick to the point of death, he dies. He's put into the tomb for four days. And they say, Lord, Lord, sisters, why did you allow this to happen? And Jesus says, that the glory of God may be revealed and that you may believe. Could it be that God allows mountains of opposition and obstacles to pile up in your life? so that his glory may be revealed, so that there's no natural explanation other than God, other than his grace. And it is all grace. Now, I wish I could stand before you this morning and say that that means that everything is going to go your way. Every mountain that's before you is going to be made low. Everything, every suffering, every sorrow, every hardship that is before you is going to just evaporate and become a plane before you. And that's not really what we find in scripture, is it? In fact, that is a false gospel. That is a narrative that will destroy your faith. Instead, what we see is that in spite of the mountains that are before us, God goes with us. And in fact, we serve a God that goes with us to the point that he has ascended the hill at Golgotha to make small the mountain of sin that stood before us and the Father. God has taken the mountain of sin and separation that stood between us and God and made it a plain so that by Christ, you and I can have renewed fellowship with God. This is all grace. God's grace prevails despite mountains of opposition. And God's grace also prevails in the day of the small things. Look at verse 10. Whoever's despised the day of the small things shall rejoice. And they really did. The Jews who, who had despised uh, the, the laying of the foundation stones did rejoice. Ezra chapter 6, verse 16 says, The people of Israel, priests, Levites, the rest of the returned exiles, celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. The people did turn and rejoice after they had despised the day of small beginnings. But I wonder if they missed out on some of the joy of God in the small things. I wonder if you and I sometimes miss out on some of the joy of God when we despise the day of small things in our own life. 
When we, when we get frustrated with just the mundane rhythms of life, God is at work in the small things. In fact, we serve a God who did not despise the small things so much that he became small, a small thing, an embryo in the womb of an unwed mother, small enough that he laid in the manger in Bethlehem, small enough that he didn't despise learning the trade of carpentry from Joseph, small enough that he lived for 30 years in obscurity, rhythms of work and rest and sleep and prayer and eating. Jesus lived out the regular rhythms of life. He didn't come and go straight to the cross. And when we allow the microwave mentality to take over in us, we despise the day of the small things. When we allow this microwave mentality to infect our faith, we believe that the small things are not as important, that God can't use them for our sanctification and transformation as much as the big things. God's grace prevails in the small things. And finally, I want you to see at the end of verse 10, God's grace prevails even when we can't perceive it. God's grace prevails even when we can't perceive it. Perceive it. Verse 10b says, these seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range throughout the whole earth. The first part of this vision was that of a, was that of a lamp that had seven lips on it for seven wicks. And so, He's interpreting this for him. And and what he's saying is not that God has seven eyes, but that God's eyes are seven, are complete. God's eyes have full, complete vision of his people all the time. And the reason that I think that this reveals something about what Zerubbabel and his people have been praying for those 15 years of silence is it's almost like hearing one half of a telephone call, right? Right? We're not hearing what Zerubbabel was necessarily praying for those 15 years. Lord, have you forgotten me? But what we're hearing is God saying to him, I haven't forgotten you. In fact, I've got seven eyes, full, complete vision of you, of your people, of their strife and pain and persecutions and suffering. I have not forgotten you. His eye is on the sparrow. His eye is upon you. But when we allow the microwave mentality to come into our lives, we begin to doubt him. It's not a problem of God's presence. It's a problem, it's a problem with our perception of his presence. A couple of months ago, the end of March, we had a big lightning strike at our house. And it was, it was awful. It destroyed all kinds of stuff. One of those things was, in fact, our microwave. And um, I have two little boys, five and three. And one of their favorite snacks or meals for us to make them are just little quesadillas. And we take the tortilla and the cheese, we throw that thing in the microwave for 18 seconds, and they are just so happy. So when our microwave got fried by the lightning strike, they were just horrified that we would have to make a quesadilla on the stove, and then it would take a couple of minutes to make instead of 18 seconds. They felt like, for real, my three-year-old Harrison, He was like, you forgot to make my quesadilla. No, I didn't. I'm just making it in a different method that takes a little longer. And I wonder if so often that is our microwave mentality with God, that we say, you forgot what you were doing here. Lord, you've forgotten me. You don't see me. You don't see my pain and my plight and my problems. And God says, I'm doing it a different way. And this verse here Zechariah 4.10, this promise that God sees you. He has not forgotten you. He will not abandon you. He will complete his purposes and fulfill his promises. That should be a message of hope for us. It was a message of hope for Zerubbabel as he completed and saw his dream come to fulfillment. But even this beautiful fulfillment of this dream for Zerubbabel, this temple, this place of communion, connection with God, stood for 500 years. Herod came in and wanted to revamp things a little bit in about 36 B.C. and took on a 46-year project of revamping the temple. But it was still Zerubbabel's temple. It was Zerubbabel's temple that Zechariah was in when the angel Gabriel appeared to him and told him that John the Baptist was on the way. It was this same temple that Mary and Joseph brought their 40-day-old 
baby Jesus to, to dedicate him to the Lord. It was this same temple that 12-year-old Jesus spent three days learning from the feet of rabbis as his parents searched frantically for him. It's this same temple that Jesus, during Passion Week, came and turned over the tables of money changers. This same temple that Jesus prophesied about, I will tear it down in three days, I will raise it up again. This temple would not stand. It was destroyed once and for all in 70 A.D., by the Romans. But we don't seek this temple. We no longer have to go to a temple to have restored relationship and communion with God because Jesus himself is the temple. Jesus himself embodies God's presence and when we meet with him, we are entering the temple. He builds us up as his temple, one not made with hands. And John, in his vision of Revelation, tells us that when we enter the new Jerusalem, when we march to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion, it will truly be a beautiful city, not the city of ashes that Zerubbabel found. But when we come into that holy city, when we make it to beautiful, beautiful Zion, there will be no temple in that city. John says in chapter 21, verse 22, he says, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. The city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. This is the eternal city that we press on towards. This is the eternal city that we fight with endurance to push back on that microwave mentality in our lives, to trust that God's grace really will prevail despite opposition, despite small things, despite our perception of his presence in our life. God fulfills his promises. God will fulfill his promises to us. Christ will return. He will make all things new and we will dwell with him, our temple, forever. 